most people do not know the key numbers in their financial life. Now, tracking your net worth is a key component to making sure that you know how healthy your financial situation is. I want you to be able to spend more on the things that you value and the things that you want. How much money do you actually make after taxes? And if you don't know that number, now is the time to start making sure you understand what that number is. And so this must be on your financial scorecard so that you can understand how this works over time. Now today, what we're going to be diving into is what we call the financial scorecard. Now, this is going to be one of those pillars to building wealth that most people need to know. And the problem with money is that most people do not know the key numbers in their financial life. And this by far is even more important than making sure you budget every day or making sure you're cutting back on expenses or making sure that you do all these little things. If you know these six numbers, you will be 80% ahead of most people. If you continue to track these six numbers every single month, this is going to be one of the biggest keys to building wealth overall because this is going to make you financially aware. And those who are financially aware are gonna be so much better off than those who try to just leave their finances on the back burner and hope everything works out. Our goal as wealth builders is to not try to hope that everything works out. Our goal is to automate everything as much as possible and be able to track specific metrics so that we know our automations are making progress. Making progress within your automations is going to be something that we must track. Otherwise, we have no idea what is going to happen. So today, we're going to be diving into these six numbers that you need to know. And as we go through these numbers, I'm going to dive deep onto why you need to understand these numbers, why they're so important to your financial health and in addition, how to do it and how to keep track of it. Now, at the top of the show, we're gonna have a link down below that you can check out that will give you a free download to be able to download your very own financial scorecard. And this will allow you to track your progress over time and kind of see where you land. Now, some of this stuff you can track quarterly if you want to. Some of this stuff I would more prefer you to track monthly. So we'll get into each of those as we go and progress throughout this. So we'll get into each of those as we progress throughout this episode. So if that's something you're into, you're ready to get your financial life in order Let's get into it. So number one, and this is one of the most important parts for most people, is tracking your net worth. Now, tracking your net worth is a key component to making sure that you know how healthy your financial situation is. Now, if you don't know what net worth is, it is the difference between the assets that you own and your liabilities. Now, what is considered an asset? An asset can be anything from the equity you have in your car, the equity you have in your home. An asset could be rental properties. It could be your stock portfolio. It could be, heck, a golf cart sitting in your garage. That could be an asset because you could sell it for a certain amount of money. It is a depreciating asset, meaning a golf cart or a car is something called a depreciating asset, meaning it goes down in value over time, but it is still an asset. Whereas the assets we really wanna hold are things like rental properties, things like stocks, things that go up in value over time. Those are true assets. Now, what do we have as a liability? A liability will be your debt payments, things that are taking money out of your pocket every single month. So it could be credit card debt. It could be debt for a mortgage. It could be debt for a business. There's a bunch of different liabilities that you can have out there that will be reducing your net worth over time. And the difference between your assets and your liabilities is going to be the total picture of your net worth. Now, if you've never tracked your net worth before and you've been in debt, you may start to track your net worth and being like, oh shoot, I have a negative net worth. And in fact, the negative net worth is much more common than you actually would think it is. Because say, for example, you just graduated from college, you have no assets to your name yet, you just start making money, but you have student loans. Well, if you have $30,000 in student loans, but you also don't have any savings or stocks or anything like that, then you would have a negative $30,000 net worth. Now we start to track this and you can start to see your net worth grow over time. Maybe it goes from negative 30,000 in year one to negative 15,000 in year two to negative 5,000 in year three. And all of a sudden year four, you have a positive net worth, and then you are taking off from there. This is what we want you to do, but you need to recognize where your net worth is today. Now, for most people, we're having an episode coming up soon where we're going to talk about where your net worth needs to be by age. And we've talked about this in the past, but we are continuously updating these, this content so that you guys have it available to you based on new inflation rates and things that shift over time. And so when you think about your net worth, you don't want to just compare it to like the median net worth out there because the median net worth, if you look at those numbers, they are way too 
too low. For example, the median net worth for someone in their 20s is like $7,000. The median net worth for someone in their 30s is like in the 30s. And you need to have a higher net worth over time as you start to progress through your financial life. And we'll talk more about that. Now, why does this matter? Number one is your net worth gives you a snapshot of your financial health. This is truly telling you, hey, you are not in a good financial situation or you're in a fantastic financial situation. Here's why. Number two, it also helps you look at the long-term perspective. This gives you the real situational perspective of exactly where you are today and what changes you need to make. My net worth is probably the most important thing that I track over time, only because I want to see that go up over time. Number three, it encourages balance, meaning that it shows how balanced you are based on your assets and your liabilities. If your liabilities are way too high and you don't have enough assets, well, you need to make a shift and start funneling as many dollars towards paying down that debt and increasing those assets. It's basically like a scale. If you think of a scale on two sides, your liabilities are just way too high on that scale. You need to balance that scale out and then increase it. You want this to be weighted heavily on the asset side, where over time, those assets are just taking over the entire scale, where over time, those assets are the the highest portion of what your net worth is. Now, as we start to progress through your net worth, there's a bunch of reasons why you wanna continually track it. But for me, it's a huge motivator for me. Every time I track my net worth and I look at this, I can see a big difference in what I wanna do with my money. I wanna make big shifts over time with what I wanna do with my money. So if you wanna calculate your net worth, here's a couple of things you can do. You can automate this process and I encourage automation with everything that you do. Monarch Money is a great place to start calculating your net worth. Why? Because when you put your uh, net worth numbers into Monarch Money, they have some really cool stuff. You can put in your mortgage, you can put in your address and it actually will calculate the Zestimate of what your house is worth. You can put in the VIN number of your car and it will tell you how much your car is worth based on the current mileage. There's a bunch of really cool tools inside Monarch money that I think is really great for net worth tracking. That is a paid tool that you can use. And if you check the link down below, uh, we can get you a month free on Monarch Money if you just want to check it out. Also, though, there's personal capital. And personal capital is a free way to check it and to track your net worth. It's not as sophisticated as Monarch Money is, but it's also a great automated way to do it. But there is something to also manually checking your net worth as well. And if you manually want to do it and adjust it, then you will stay definitely on top of it uh, because you're making those manual adjustments. So if you are using the scorecard that we have that you can download below, make sure you put in your net worth at least every quarter, if not every year, uh, at a minimum every single year. I like to do it quarterly just to kind of see where I land. Monthly is a little iffy because if you start to develop uh, a larger index fund portfolio or a larger ETF portfolio, or you buy more stocks, those can fluctuate a lot. And you don't want to go crazy over your net worth because that can go down depending on how much you have in there, you know, six figures in a month at times, and you don't want to get discouraged by that. So checking the net worth every month is probably something you don't want to do unless you enjoy that process and the numbers going up and down drastically based on your stocks doesn't bother you. But if you're in debt and you have a negative net worth, I want you checking that every month. I want you to feel Feel that pain a little bit because I want you to stay motivated to pay down that debt. So it depends on what situation you are in. If you freak out because the stock market is volatile, then don't check it every month. But if you are in debt and you are trying to stay motivated, please try to check that every month. Now, how do you do this? First, you calculate your assets. So you're going to add everything from your cash to your retirement accounts, to your investment accounts, to your real estate, vehicles, if they're significant, or any other personal property, if you own diamond rings or anything like that, you can add that to your net worth. Now, there are things that I do not add to my net worth personally. Like, for example, when I'm calculating my net worth, I actually don't add my vehicles because they're depreciating assets. Are they assets that you can add to your net worth? Yes, you can absolutely do that. This is more of a personal preference for me because I know over time, those are just gonna go down to zero and value. And so for me, I'm just not really, really gung ho on tracking my vehicles. I will put them in there at times just to kind of see where they land and what their value is. But for the most part, I am not interested in tracking depreciating assets in my net worth. So typically I don't put them in my net worth statement, even though they would increase my net worth. I just don't do it because they depreciate over time. Now that's a personal preference. Again, you can do it if you want to. So you add all of those in and then you calculate your liabilities. So you add up all your debts, including mortgages, student loans, auto loans, credit card balance, personal loans, business loans, all of those go into your liabilities, 
especially if you're something like an S corp where those business loans kind of trickle down to you, uh, definitely want to make sure you're including that as well. And then you take your net worth, which is your total assets minus your liabilities. It's a pretty simple formula. It's just kind of collecting all the data and putting them in. Now, there are some common missteps I've seen from people. Some people don't count all of their liabilities in their net worth statement, or they just add up their assets to make themselves feel good. But once you put those liabilities in, you're going to see the real financial picture. It makes sure that you're adding in your liabilities. Don't leave those out. Don't hurt your yourself just because you want to feel better about yourself. You want to make sure that you're tracking this honestly. And then when you put in depreciating assets, things like cars, things like electronics, anything of that nature, I want you to be super conservative with those. I don't want you to just start to try to say, hey, this is what I think it's going to be worth. And it's 20% above what it's going to be worth. These are going to go down in value over time which is really, to me, something I just don't really love tracking them in there, but they are gonna go down in value over time, so you need to make sure that you are conservative when you do that. Your net worth should be growing over time. If you're starting out with a zero net worth or a negative net worth, I don't want you to get discouraged. This should motivate you. I started with a net worth that was at zero, and when I started at zero, I started tracking my net worth and it motivated the heck out of me because I saw where my net worth needs to go. And so that was so motivating for me. So this is why we put it first and foremost on your financial scorecard. I want you to see this first. This is the number one thing I want you to see is your net worth. And so for most people, this is going to help motivate you as well, I hope. And if it doesn't, then it, it should be something at least making sure that you update it once every single year. Now let's get into number two. All right. So number two is something that you need to really get grander about on, on how we track this. And number two is going to be expenses. Now expenses is twofold because there's two different areas of expenses that I really want you to think through. Now, number one is going to be the most important, which is your baseline costs. Some people call it fixed costs. We call it baseline costs here. And what that means is these are the costs that you absolutely need to make sure that you account for. Every month, you're gonna have to have these costs in your budget no matter what. So I'm talking about your necessities, the things that you need every single month to live. Housing is one, food, transportation. Now, when we're talking about uh, those three costs up front, those are something that I want you to make sure that you know. Your housing, your food, and your transportation. If you don't know those three costs, how do you ever expect to be able to get ahead? These are what we call the big three. And with those big three, if you can keep those costs in check, you can pretty much spend lavishly on most other things because you kept those three costs in check. And so I want you to know that housing, food, transportation. In addition, as healthcare starts to rise, we want to track our healthcare a little bit. Now, if you're younger in your 20s or 30s, maybe you're not spending a ton on healthcare, but as you hit your 40s, 50s, 60s, healthcare is going to be a big, big factor for you. And so we need to make sure that we are tracking healthcare. In addition, debt payments is also something that is going to be one of your baseline costs. This is your foundation of stability. This is where you need to know what this number is, because if anything happened to you in your life, at least you need to be able to cover these baseline costs. So it's very, very important to make sure that you know what that number is. So this is level one of costs. Now there's two levels to costs that we need to talk through. Two is lifestyle money or once. Okay. When it comes to two, two can get to become a gray area where we think we have needs, but they're actually just wants. So what are examples of lifestyle money? What are examples of things that you actually want? This is gonna be dining out and entertainment, okay? Travel and vacations, shopping, leisure and hobbies, kids activities. That might sting for some people, but this is another thing that also is a want. It is not a need, it is a want. These are all things that I think for most of us, we wanna be able to spend more money on. And that's what I want for every single person listening or watching this podcast is I want you to be able to spend more on the things that you value and the things that you want. That is part of what we talk about here. And so I want more dollars going to your vacations. I want more dollars going towards dining out and more dollars going towards the things that you value in life. But we have to have a plan to develop how we can get there. Because if you are spending all of your money on those baseline costs, then really we are dealing with a harder situation. Now you can think back to our episode uh, a couple of episodes ago called the five levels of managing money flow. If you don't remember that episode, we had something called the debt cycle and we had the paycheck to paycheck cycle. If you're in those two cycles, the debt cycle or the paycheck to paycheck cycle, meaning you're spending 70% on needs, 30% on wants and 0% on savings, then we need to think through how we are going through this process because your needs or your baseline costs are very important to control over time. Now, if you don't make a lot of money, 
which we'll talk about in a second. If you don't like make a lot of money, then increasing your income may be the answer, which is obviously easier said than done. But if your baseline costs are eating up the majority of your budget, more so than you know over 60% of your budget, then we need to see if we can make some adjustments even, either on how much we are spending and or how much we are making. And between those two things, that is going to tell us a huge factor. So this is why we need to track expenses. One, we need to know A, how much we're gonna have in an emergency fund built up over time. And B, we also need to know where we need to make adjustments on our spending. Spending can get way out of control for anyone out there. I've told this story a number of times. I've talked to people who make almost a million dollars per year in cash, net cash, and they are living paycheck to paycheck because they do not track their spending properly. Now, how do we automate this process? Because with all of these, we want to make sure that we are automating our money. We're not just going in there and trying to one by one calculate all this stuff. We want this automated. Again, Monarch Money is a great spot to do that in uh, because it'll track all your expenses in one place. You can put them in categories, needs, and wants and be able to separate those items. And so that can help you do it automatically and it trains it uh, over time to be able to do that. There's other places to do it as well, but Monarch Money is my favorite one. It's the one I use to automate this process. So that's number two is tracking your expenses. We need to make sure we separate it by those needs and those baseline costs and those wants or lifestyle money, money that we wanna spend more of. And we wanna, we wanna track that lifestyle money too so that we can increase that number. I want you to increase that number over time and I want you to get value out of your money. I don't want this to be something that's restrictive. I want this to be something that allows you to thrive over time. Your dollars are gonna allow you to thrive and making sure you track some of this stuff is gonna be helpful. Now, again, it doesn't have to take a bunch of time to track it. This sounds like something that could to, you know, take you hours and hours every single month. No, this should take you five to 10 minutes if you're automating this process. Make sure you are automating those costs. Let's get into number three. All right, number three is gonna be income. It is absolutely amazing how many people I talk to who don't actually know how much money they make. Now, a lot of people may know their salary. People will tell them their salary, hey, I make $78,000 per year. Hey, I make $95,000 per year. Hey, I make $126,000 per year. A lot of people know how much they make. That is your gross income, the amount of money that is put on paper in front of you when you get a job offer. Okay, your gross income is that number. Now, if you're hourly, you may not even know that number. Number one is you need to know your gross income. And we're going to put this on this and you need to know what that is. So that's just what your offer before taxes or anything else is taken out. But secondly, one thing you really need to know, and it's amazing to me how many people don't know this number is your net income. You need to know how much money goes into your bank account every single year, every single month, every single week or biweekly. How much money do you actually make after taxes? And if you don't know that number, now is the time to start making sure you understand what that number is. This is gonna impact a lot of things that you do and most people don't realize how much it can impact a lot of things you do. People think in the back of their head, hey, I make you know, X amount of dollars every couple of weeks. You may even know what your paycheck is, but you don't know what your net income number is. So. One, your take-home pay is going to allow you to know all kinds of different things. Now, this is money that comes out after you've already paid taxes. This is money that is after you have contributed to your 401k, or if you've done your 401k match, or your HSA through your company, or any other employer contributions, your, your stock purchase plans, all of that stuff. Whatever is left after that is what you have available for other things. Now, this could be available for other things like putting it into your Roth IRA or putting it in your brokerage account or paying for your baseline costs or paying for your wants. And so we need to know how much money is available to do that in that bucket so that we can figure out how to allocate those dollars realistically. This will allow us to really make realistic spending decisions. This will also allow us to understand, you know, what is the fuel to the fire? Because income is the fuel to the fire that's going to allow you to build wealth over time. The difference between your income and your expenses, that gap between there is going to allow us to take those dollars and start to shovel it into the fire, which is financial independence. Taking it like coal and shoveling it into that fire. The more dollars you put into your investments every single month, the sooner you will be able to retire. This is a very simple process, a very simple math equation, much harder to implement why we automate everything. And so as you start to understand what your net income is and you compare it to what your baseline expenses are and you compare it to what your wants are, once you know that, you know how much money you have available to start investing and fueling that fire. So we must know how much money we make for that reason first. Also, the second reason why we need to know how much money we make 
is because we need to know how much is increasing every single year. Let's say, for example, your boss gives you a 3% raise, okay? First of all, that's a 3% raise before taxes. After taxes, you get that money, it trickles down. Maybe you jumped into a different tax bracket, you didn't even know it. Or maybe it's just not as much as you originally thought it was in the back of your head, which is what happens to most people. I think they overestimate what a bonus is actually going to be instead of underestimating what that bonus is going to be or that increase in pay. And so when you get that increase in pay, you need to know how much money, more money you are having. So A, you can allocate a percentage towards investments. And then B, so that you can take an extra percentage put it towards your wants or your whatever else you want to do with those dollars, and you can make sound financial decisions. C, the third reason why you want to make sure that you know what your net income is, is because you want to track it over time so that you can see it increasing and you want to see it increasing dramatically. Tracking your net income will change your life. And if you do not do this, if you do not put it into some sort of spreadsheet or some sort of calculation every single year, you will see a direct, direct impact from how much money you make to how much your wealth grows over time if you're good with money. If you're tracking those expenses, if you're tracking your net worth, if you watch your income increase every single year and you focus on doing this, you really focus on increasing your income every single year, not just thinking about like, hey, oh, that'd be a good business business idea or hey, uh, maybe I'll negotiate my salary a little bit. No, if you get strategic about this stuff, I promise you in the next five years, you will be making a lot more money than you do now but you have to be very, very strategic about this because you'll see that 3% raise come in and inflation's at 5%. You just took a pay cut. If they offer you a 3% raise and inflation's at a 5% increase, you took a pay cut. And this is the huge problem with not tracking your income. You need to make sure that you know what that net income is, what's actually trickling down to you so that A, you can negotiate your salary, B, you can make sound financial decisions, C, you can put together this massive plan that I want you to increase your income because this is the catalyst to building wealth over time. And so making sure that we're tracking our income over time is going to be a huge, huge deal for most people. So let's push gross income. We wanna know what our gross income is and let's also be tracking our net income and see what that trickles down to. Now, how do you track your net income? A couple ways to do it. You could take your paycheck, for example, and say you get paid every two weeks uh, or you get paid twice a month. You can take that number and multiply it by 26 and you'll get the amount that you make net every single year. Or if you get paid bi-weekly, then just set it up for those bi-weekly payments. There's a bunch of different ways to do this, but it's a quick, simple math equation. You need to know that number. You need to know it. If I ask you, if I met you and you, if I saw you in the street when people stopped me, if you stopped me in the middle of the street and I turned to you and I said, what's your net income? I want you to be able to know it right away. It's really, really important to know that number because we want to put a plan together to motivate us to increase that number over time so that we can build wealth and enjoy the things that we do every single day. So number three is income. We're going to track gross and net when we do this. All right. Number four is savings rate. Now, savings rate is one of the most important metrics if you want to achieve financial independence. You need to know what your savings rate is because savings rate can make a massive difference on how fast and how soon you can retire. So number one is savings rate is directly linked to your wealth accumulation. If you want to accumulate more and more wealth over time, your savings rate is going to be a huge factor. At a minimum here, we would talk about uh, making sure that we are saving at least 20% of our income towards emergency fund and investments. That's at a bare minimum. And I want you to increase that number over time. Really, I want you to get to that 25 to 30% range and even higher if you can. But starting at 20% is going to be a great starting point. You're going to hear people out there say 10% savings rate. And I'm going to show you why here in a second, why that may not be the very best option for most people. Because if you start to only save, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15% of your money, you're going to be working for 30 plus years. And for most people who want to achieve financial independence, that's not something they're super interested in. Secondly, your savings rate also gives you the buffer for emergencies. Being able to save money into your emergency fund, which is in a high yield savings account, is going to be something that's really important to protect your wealth over time so that you can continue to grow your wealth over time. Third, though, is it gives you flexibility and freedom. The more money that you can save over time, this allows you more flexibility, more freedom. And the closer and closer you get to that financial independence number, the sooner you can be able to retire. If you're listening to me right now and you're sitting in a cubicle and you absolutely hate your job, your savings 
savings rate is the catapult that's going to allow you to do that. The difference between saving and your income is going to be a huge, huge factor if you start to grow both of those things. And so as we do this, I want you to understand why a 5% or a 10% savings rate just really doesn't make a ton of sense. So if you look at something like an 8% rate of return in your investment portfolio, and if you got that 8% rate of return over the course of a bunch of different years, and you had a 5% savings rate, you would have to work for 47 years before you'd be able to retire. Your savings rate directly impacts how soon you can retire, okay? If you had a 10% savings rate, it would take you 38 years to be able to retire. I don't want any of you working for 38 years if you don't wanna be working. And so people out there saying, hey, at least save 10% of your income. Sure, that's a great starting point, but I need you to increase that savings rate over time by at least 1% a month until you can get to that 20% range so that you can actually be able to retire. Because at 15% savings rate, you're still working 32 years. And at 20% savings rate, that's what gets you below that 30 year threshold if you wanna be able to retire early. If you save 20% of your income, you can retire in 28 years. Now, that's the amazing part about starting at 20%. The reason why I like 30% for most people is that's where you can retire at 22 years is at that 20% range with an 8% rate of return. If you got a higher rate of return, you could actually retire sooner. But at 30%, that gives you 22 years before you can retire. Now, let's say, for example, you are increasing your income over time, and now you could start to save even more over time. So let's say you can save half of your income and the, re the other half of your income uh, you use for your needs and your wants. And so if you save 50% of your income, you can retire in 14 years, which is why increasing the savings rate over time is so incredibly important. It has a direct impact towards how soon you can retire. I want you all to be able to retire as soon as you possibly want to. Or if you love your job, guess what you got? You've got FU money meaning money that is available in your brokerage account that if your boss changes or if something shifts within your company, you don't wanna do this anymore, you have the money there to make that choice. Savings gives you choices. And so increasing that savings rate is going to allow you to have the most choices in life where nobody has a say over your life. And that's what I want for each and every single person here. Now, there's two different places to put your savings. Number one, is savings towards investments. Now, saving towards investments is going to be what allows you to be able to retire. When I'm talking about this 8% rate of return, the only way to do that is to invest your dollar. So making sure you save money towards investments is gonna be really, really powerful. But at the beginning, when you're still on your beginning of your financial journey, we also need to make sure we are saving cash on hand for emergencies by using the 136 method. Now, if you've never heard of our 136 method, we have an entire episode uh, talking about that that we can link up down below. And in addition, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll put a card up top. And when we do this, we want to make sure that we are doing the 136 method for, for saving up, meaning saving one month first, paying off any high interest debt, then going to three months and starting to invest, and then going to finally six months of cash on hand. And so when we do that over time, it's going to be really, really important to follow that methodology uh, for savings for emergencies. I want you to track your savings towards investments, and I want you to track your savings towards emergencies. If you're thinking to yourself, well, hey, I'm at that three-month mark, how much should go to each? I would put as much as you could towards uh, investments, maybe 70% investments, 30% to emergencies, something along those lines. And it, really what your goal is, is to get to that six-month mark. You can go 50-50 also, but your goal is to get to that six month in cash so that you can get all of it shoveled into investments. That's your real goal uh, over time. And so you, your savings rate towards your investments and your savings rate towards your emergencies, both those numbers put together is your combined savings rate. That's what we're talking about. Now, if you're saving money for a car down payment or a house down payment, I don't consider that towards your saving rate because you're going to spend those dollars. What goes towards your savings rate is emergencies and your investment money. That's where your savings rate is, and that's the number I want you to bring up over time. And really, when we talk about savings rate, and I give you those numbers of, hey, 20% savings rate gets you 28 years to retire, that is where I really want you to be able to put that 20% towards investments. So once you start to crank 20% towards investments, that'll make it toward 28 years to your Till you can retire. And so we need to just increase that number over time so that we can achieve those goals. I'm going to put that whole chart on the screen on YouTube too. If you haven't seen it yet, 8% uh, return for a 4% safe withdrawal rate is how we ran those numbers. And so just let me know if you have any questions on that. All right. Number five is debt. And debt is something that when you start to track your net worth, your income is already going to be tracked, obviously. Or when you start to track your net worth, your debt will be tracked 
during this process. And so it'll force you to start tracking your debt, but I want you to break your debt into two pieces, which is why we wanna put this as one of the six numbers you need to know in your financial scorecard here, okay? And so when you have this number, I want you to put it high interest debt and low interest debt. Now, what is high interest debt? High interest debt for us, our definition is anything above a 6% interest rate is considered high interest debt. Now, this is something where the mortgage comes into play and people will say, hey, I've got a mortgage at a 7.5% interest rate during, you know, right after COVID when interest rates were super, super high. Would you count that as high interest pants on fire emergency? I would not for your mortgage only. And the reason for this is because down the line, you can take this and refinance that number. I don't want you to put financial stress on yourself and miss out on investing because you're trying to pay down a $300,000 or $400,000 mortgage as fast as you possibly can. The average home in America right now is selling for $430,000. So if you have a $300,000 mortgage, the last thing I want you to do is put all your dollars towards that mortgage with an asset that really is not even that great of an asset. If you wanna hear why we think that, you can listen to another episode, we'll link it up down below. But total cost of ownership is the true reason why we think that. And so because of this, instead, I want you to just kind of wait till rates drop and then have a plan to refinance that mortgage to a lower than 6% interest rate. That's the goal that you need to have uh, when you do this. But everything else, credit cards, personal loans, any other loans with an interest rate, cars, any other loan like that with an interest rate above 6%, we need to work on either restructuring, refinancing, or getting it below that 6% rate or paying it off. Credit cards are gonna have to pay off no matter what, or you could do a balance transfer to a 0%, but I want you to pay it off before that balance transfer uh, finishes. Any of that consumer debt stuff, that needs to go. That is a pants on fire emergency that hurts your net worth, that reduces your net worth, and in addition is something where it is stealing money away that you could be investing. It is stealing that from you. It is stealing your freedom from you. And instead, you have to take those dollars and pay a bank. That is the last thing I want for you. I want you to beat the banks. That's what we try to teach you here is how to beat the banks and paying interest is not one big way to do that. So for anybody who is in debt out there, we have a free debt course. If you go to mastermoney.co slash courses, you'll see our free debt course there. It is something I hope each and every single one of you who is in debt looks at because uh, it takes you like an hour and it'll give you a plan on how to pay off your debt. Really, really important stuff there. Uh, really excited for you guys to be able to, to check that out. Now, as you put together a plan to start paying down debt, uh, you wanna make sure that you are thinking through you know exactly the structure you want to do this. So list out all of your debts and then put them in order of when you want to pay them off. I like the highest interest rate to lowest interest rate. You could also do the snowball method. Like if you have a couple small debts, just get those paid off first, throw them out, get them out of the way. Uh, if you have like, you know, anything above that 6% interest rate, and then the rest of it can fall into play within your plan. But that debt course will kind of walk you through that process on exactly how to do that. And then the last thing you could also track if you want to get bonus points is your debt to income ratio. And so your debt to income ratio is something that's going to help you understand, you know, do I have way too many debt payments going on here with my current financial situation? And how do I actually need to be thinking about that? So your debt progress, I want you to check on this one monthly too, along with your income, your savings rate. All of those need to be checked on monthly uh, because I think they need the most attention when it comes to seeing where you're progressing over time. Now, number six is one that I think most people are going to need to be tracking, and we're going to get to that next. Now, number six is going to be your retirement number. And if you don't know what your retirement number is, I'm going to show you how to get the quick calculation. But this is the number one thing I want most people to do when they want to stay motivated is figuring out what the number needs to be in order for them to be able to retire. Now, this number is going to be the amount of money that you need invested to be able to retire. And you need to track this number. Uh, over time, it's going to change. Now, let me give you an example here. So in my 20s, I had a specific retirement number that I was tracking and I was trying to get aggressively uh, towards it. It was a lean fire number, meaning it was like the bare minimum I could retire on. But as time progressed, I got married, I had kids. And so this number is increasing over time because my lifestyle is changing. This is why we track this, because it is going to change over time and we need to adjust 
everything else to fall into place to our new retirement number. And so how do you figure out what your retirement number is going to be? First, we're going to assess, hey, how much do we think we will spend in retirement? This is one of the hardest numbers to figure out. Nobody's going to get this perfectly right at the beginning, but over time, you're going to get a better understanding of probably where you need to be. And so when you think about this, you're going to say to yourself, do I need $80,000 per year in retirement? Let's just use that as an example. So if you need $80,000 per year in retirement, what you're going to do is you're going to take 80,000 and you're going to multiply that by 25. This is the rule of 25. And once you do that, you're going to get a number. And that number, 80,000 times 25 for easy math is $2 million. And so $2 million, if you wanted to spend $80,000 per year in retirement, you would need $2 million invested in order to retire. That, my friends, is once you get that calculation and you understand what that number is, that is your North Star. That is gonna be your guiding light to allow you to start progressing towards your goals. And so this must be on your financial scorecard uh, so that you can understand how this works over time. Now, it is a really simple calculation. It is very hard to nail down. So you need to start to track it now so that you can make those adjustments as you start to think and progress over time and your lifestyle changes. And a number of other factors are gonna come into play. When you try to figure out how much am I going to be spending in retirement, you got to think through health care. you got to think through housing. Am I even going to have a mortgage? Is this going to be paid off? Or am I going to be paying rent when I'm in, in retirement? you got to think through, am I going to have kids in the household? Am I going to be paying for college? Is there, you know, what kind of things are going on in your life that would impact how much money you are spending towards this number? And so figuring out your retirement number is the last one. It is an easy calculation. Again, it's multiplying those expenses by 25 and that will tell you exactly where exactly you're gonna land. And so you also wanna think through travel and other expenses as well as you start to calculate this number. And we're gonna do an entire episode on how to kind of figure out your expenses in retirement so that you can get closer to that number because I wanna make this clear picture for you to help you through that process. So listen, those are the, fi that's the financial scorecard. Those are the six numbers that you need to be tracking in order to be able to build wealth and understand where your money is. If you guys have any questions, please join us on the Master Money Newsletter. You can ask questions there. I truly appreciate each and every single one of you listening to this episode, and we will see you on the next episode.